Well, I want you just to get ready because we're going to have a really fun uh, day today. We're going into part three of our Divine Guidance series. And um, I think every single one of us has a desire. I mean, everybody that's born wants to know, what, why am I here? What is my purpose? What is my destiny? And how can I know God's will for our lives? How many of you want to know every single day you're walking in God's will? Lift up your hands so I can see. Absolutely. We want to live this life with purpose. And we want to know that we know right? How many of you have made a big decision? I know this is everybody, but a big decision, whether it was a big financial commitment, it's, oh, you know, am I going to marry this person? Should I take that job? Should I move to that city? And you didn't know that you knew. It's a horrible feeling. You know, we can say, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and we'll make these big decisions with wishful or hopeful thinking. But it's kind of like when we were kids and we told all of our friends, I'm going to the high dive. Remember that? This generation doesn't get it. They've removed the high dive for insurance purposes. But I think that was a great fleshing out about not overcommitting, right, or just overcoming fears. But I'm going to the high dive. And then you got up to that high dive, and it was like, that doesn't look like 10 or 12 feet. It looks like 100, right? And you just stand a little bit too long on that. But the fact is, is every single one of us can know God's will. And there's something about being able to walk out your life an absolute confidence that you're living in your destiny, that you're with the people that you're supposed to be with, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, that your talents and abilities and everything that God's made you for is on the right path. But there's a lot of people that make big decisions in our world based on, like I said, wishful thinking or hopeful thinking. Before those that don't know Jesus, I'm sending out positive vibes to the universe. You ever see that? What is sending out positive vibes? You guys remember the Care Bears? They had like this power that came from their chest, like the Care Bear stare, right? Power, powerful vibes or positive energy and vibes in the universe. Some go a little bit deeper. There's some people uh, that sadly, you know, look to astrology or psychics or fortune tellers. And they ask them some of the most important questions. Is there a special person coming in my life? Should I take this job and opportunity? Is there something I should be looking out for? And they're asking people that are strangers about the future. And I always just want to say, look at the building that these people are in. Have you guys ever seen those fortune tellers and psychic reading buildings? They're always shacks. They always look like they're ready to fall over. You know, you can spot their car. You know, it's got all these hippie stickers on it, and it's the most rusted out bucket in the parking lot. And I'm like, why would anybody ask that person what's happening? Because if they were really good, they wouldn't need clients. They just pick the right lotto numbers, right? They would know what the right stocks are, but yet they have no money. So, you know, before we start bagging those people, I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but inwardly answer honestly, how many of us Christians have gotten overly excited about a fortune cookie? <laughs> I'm guilty. We go to Panda Express, I'm not leaving without all four of those fortune cookies, and I'm like, okay, kids, let's see what we get. And I, of course, always get the lame one, right? But what good are they, right? Now, if I was the God of heaven, and I had Christian sons and daughters, I would rewrite the fortune cookies like this, right here. Number one, look at this one on the slide. Ignore previous cookie. <laughs> and then when they tried it again and disobeyed, I'd put this. Error 404, fortune not found. And then the last one, fail, right? But the fact is, we all want divine guidance, and many people go through life not sure. Many people go through life not knowing they're living out God's will or fulfilling his destiny for their lives. But the fact is, is we only have one life and we only have one eternity. So life is way too precious to not know what God has led us to. And God's will is actually quite simple, but it doesn't make it necessarily easy. That roadmap he's given us is simple, but it's not necessarily easy. Why? Let's do a recap of what we've gone through. Week number one is the key to guidance. My dad preached this message. That the rest that we're going to talk about these succeeding weeks aren't going to work unless, number one, the key to guidance is consecration. Every single one of us, if we want God's will, we have to be 100% completely his. We have to say everything I am Everything I have, all my dreams, all my purposes, they're completely yours, Lord. Lord, have your way 
in my life. And when you're completely the Lord's, then you will see his sovereign hand moving in your life. Then the second one is this. This was like week number two. The primary guidance that God has given us outside of his lordship, the primary guidance is his word, and it is a form of lordship. Matter of fact, I don't know if you remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan himself, and Satan was telling Jesus to do all these things. Remember that after 40 days of being in the wilderness fasting? Jesus came, and then Satan was telling him all these things. And what did Jesus battle Satan with? The word. Now, Jesus is the word. He has written his word, and he himself lived according and under his own word. Isn't that powerful? So how much more should we be living according to his word? The Bible, God's word, is the authority for everything that we have, and it is our primary guide for all of life's issues. How many of you have read Psalm 119? It is literally the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. If I was going to preach last week, I wasn't able to, and I had to ask Pastor Joe on Saturday to do it and gave him my notes. But I literally was thinking, hey, why don't we just read through the whole psalm? And then I went and timed it. It would have taken two-thirds of the preaching time just reading 176 verses about the benefits, the blessings, the riches the wisdom, the joy, the life, everything that God's Word has given us. 176 verses of God's Word telling us how important God's Word is. So if you sometimes struggle with that, that, that desire to read God's Word, go read Psalm 119, and after 176 verses of God telling you the benefits, I believe that you're going to be like David, where he says, how sweet is your law. I meditated on, all it, on it all day long. It's like honey on my mouth. King David, who had a heart after God like nobody else and was the most successful king in Israel outside of, of course, King Jesus, simply said this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So first and foremost, we got to be all in. Second, we've got to be digesting God's word and it will become a part of who you are. Because every single one of us makes decisions every single day based upon our beliefs, on our values, according to wisdom as we know it. And God's word is the one that defines that and helps us to know what specifically to do in different situations and circumstances. But there's a problem. We can have all of that. But I don't know about you, when I was making big decisions in life that were very specific God's word didn't tell me who to marry. You know, God's word doesn't say, hey, turn to Matthew chapter 4, you're supposed to marry Betty so-and-so. Russ, you're supposed to marry Carrie Hurley. Russ, you're supposed to go pastor again. Russ, you're supposed to go move to Fort Myers. God's word doesn't have those specifics, so outside of the values and beliefs and knowing the character of God, how do we know the specifics in those bigger decisions of life? How do we know what God's will is? Well, I'm glad you asked. Today is week three. It's called the secondary guidance. God's word is primary, but this is the secondary way that God leads you and I in all sorts of ways, and I think you're going to bear witness with a lot of this, and 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 I want you to hold on to that word witness. Your secondary guidance starts with your inner witness. Say inner witness. You already have this. It's the voice of your conscience. God's word in his word says that his word is already written on your heart. That you and I already have a moral compass. There's that inner witness of morality. We're going to read this text that uses that word witness, but in the Greek it means it's like an inner check. Anybody ever felt that before, right? That inner check, that inner confirmation that you know that you know, and sometimes you don't know why you know that you know. Are you talking about it? Know what I'm talking about? It's a how do I know, but I don't know. I don't have the information, but yet I have this inner sense, this inner witness. Now, we know what's right or wrong. And outside of the Bible, it's very clear whether you know God or whether you don't know God, there is an inner witness and a voice as a child. Matter of fact, Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio tells us, let your conscience be your guide. But Paul explains it in Romans chapter 2, whether you know God or whether you don't know God. Every one of us are created in his image. Every one of us has that inner moral compass from birth. Listen to him explain it in Romans chapter 2, verse 14. 
And when he's speaking of the Gentiles, he's speaking of the non-Jews or those that do not worship God and do not have his law. Indeed, Paul's speaking, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature require that which is required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Are you guys catching this? Now, he explains it. Since they show that the requirements of God's law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, that check, that confirmation, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Every person knows inside from a birth the difference between right or wrong. I'll give you the best example. Have you ever watched little babies when they become like toddlers, when they can move around and interact with other babies? You see two little two-year-olds fighting over the same toy, you know, the little tools and stuff, and the little kid grabs a plastic hammer, a little toolbox, and hits the other kid in the head and whacks the kid in the head and didn't think anything of it until an adult saw them for the first time. You ever see your kid start crying when you didn't even say anything, when they saw that you saw? How did they know that first time? How did they know it was wrong? Because God's word is already active in their heart. But from birth, we're all battling that virus inside of us called sin. There is both, we are created in God's image. We know what's good, but we also have this sinful desire to do evil. And those two warring desires wage against us our entire lives. I could do several messages just on that. But Paul is showing that we all have this conscience in our heart. And sin tries to silence that. Sin, if we give in to it, can begin to numb and desensitize our conscience. Have you ever looked at some people, or even sometimes even yourself, if you're being honest, when you did something, why did I do that? Because you had already ignored your conscience, or these people have already ignored it to where there's some people that are almost like psychopaths, and you're like, how do they get like that? God's Word explains it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, 4 verse 2. Paul's speaking again talking honestly about religious people. How could the religious leaders not see Jesus being the Son of God or did not see him as being holy? Yet they were religious. Listen to this. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. That word seared literally means what it says. In the Greek, it was literally a term speaking of a burn victim who, who the burn had damaged the nerve endings where there was no sensitivity whatsoever. It was completely deadened. And when we ignore that inner witness that God has given us, we literally begin to sear that conscience of ours and it becomes numb and we don't even hear it anymore. God has given you and I an inner voice, and it also includes what I call the sixth sense. I call it my spidey senses. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You don't know anything, but something says to you, something's not right. Don't trust it. Don't go in there. There's something off. It sounds too good to be true, right? And everything else could be on this one ledger. Everything looks perfect and there's that sixth sense. Listen to it. I've learned when I don't listen to that voice, I pay the penalty. Now, I know I'm going to sound like I'm showing favoritism here, but it's just flat out the truth. This is a generality. Ladies, you have a great sixth sense. They call it women's intuition. We're all given intuition. And guys, sometimes we can be just so cerebral that we're not paying attention to that sixth sense. But have guys, have you ever had your wife say, something's not right? And you're like, oh, honey, come on, da-da-da-da-da-da. And then later on, she's going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've learned to listen to my wife's intuition. We were desperate for babysitters when we were in Hawaii. There was nobody to help watch our kids. We never had a break, no family. All the friends were working. How were we ever going to get a break? And our next door neighbor had, oh, I have this great babysitter, da 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 And we met her, and she looked like the sweetest little grandma. She looked so fantastic. I'm like, answer to prayer. She didn't charge much. And my wife goes, no way. She's not coming in my house. I go, why? She goes, something's wrong, babe. I go, honey, they've been using her for weeks. She's fantastic, babe. I'm like, babe, we need, a, we need a date night. She's like, nobody's getting my house with my kids if I feel that. 
Then our neighbor found out that this lady was stealing stuff from them over the last several weeks. Sweetest little grandma. Listen to your spidey senses. Amen? Guys, listen. Let your wife be your guide. That's Jiminy Cricket for you guys right there. So your secondary guidance starts with your inner witness. Now the next one's even more powerful. It's number two is the witness of the spirit. Say spirit. There is a big difference between your personal intuition or your personal convictions and that of the witness of the spirit. I don't have time to get into it, but this is where a lot of Christians get into arguments. I believe God spoke to me this, and I'm going, but God's word says that. Sometimes our personal convictions can be off, or sometimes we think, just because I feel this, therefore it is God. And I say there is a fine membrane between personal convictions and the witness of the Spirit, and you have to develop that. But the witness of the Spirit hits your spirit. And the Spirit is the very core of who you and I are. We, we have a spirit. It is the very essence when our body, when, when our mind and our body and everything that we think of ourselves cease to exist, our spirit is that which lasts and goes to be with the Lord. It's in the spirit where God does his greatest work. It's in the spirit where there's that, that definition of you definitely know that you know that you know. And the Holy Spirit can do that. So I want to talk about different witnesses of the Holy Spirit. And he wants you to develop this. The first one is the witness of conviction. Say conviction. We don't like that word, do we? But honestly, if the Holy Spirit did not convict your spirit and my spirit of our sins, we wouldn't have relationship with him. It's that conviction that something is not right in our lives. It's that conviction, it's that witness, it's that check, it's that confirmation that God lets us know that there's sin in our lives and we got to get right with him and, and thank God for that conviction. We try to avoid conviction because it doesn't make us feel good. I remember how many times the Holy Spirit came and convicted me be between the ages of 15 to 20 when I was running from him. And I avoided the presence of God and that conviction because it didn't make me feel good. But the reason he does that is because he wants to heal those areas. Listen to John chapter 16 verse 8. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. And he, the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit comes, will convict the world regarding to sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. If you believe in Christ and you see his holiness, right? And concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Jesus was the example of holy living and righteous living and sinless living. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. The Holy Spirit's witness of conviction is a gift. Do not run away from anything that the Holy Spirit brings you. Because everything in God's intentionality and heart is agape and love and for your and my betterment. I am so thankful whenever the Holy Spirit speaks to me. Even if it's a conviction. Why? The Father disciplines those he loves. King David said in Psalm 23, your rod, meaning discipline, and your staff, meaning love and guidance, they comfort me. David knew that when God disciplined him, it was for his betterment. Amen? So it's the witness of conviction, and we should welcome anything the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. Secondly is the witness of assurance. This is the part of what happens after you've let the Holy Spirit do his work of conviction. This is the witness from God that you are in right relationship with him forever. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Because this is talking about how we have that assurance to live that victorious God-destined life. Paul said, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, listen to verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's the witness of his assurance that you are right with me. And not only are you right with me, you are my child and you will be with me forever. And because you are my child, you can ask anything in my name according to my purposes and it shall be done. You can ask for bread and I'm not going to give you a stone when you're with my child. But I'm not like this, God. I'm not deserving. No, I've adopted you. I've chosen you. I've placed the highest value on you. And when that assurance, that witness, that check... 
You know what I'm talking about? My dad actually mentioned this. This is what the Puritans called heaven on earth. We have that song, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine and that assurance. Oh, what a foretaste, a sampling, a little bit of glory divine. It's the witness of assurance. You need to listen to it. Then there's what I call the witness of peace. So the Bible says the witness of peace. This is so, so important. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. You mean, my mind says this, and it's all going to be bad, and there's no way, and it's impossible, and I'm going to be destroyed, and this, I'm going to lose everything. But then the peace of God comes, which overrules, overreigns, nullifies negates the negative into a positive and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus it's the witness of peace I call it the peace factor I've learned as I've been serving the Lord I know his word I know his voice I know his spirit but if he's not even giving me a check if I don't have peace about something I either back off or I wait. God's ways, he always leads in peace. It's the peace factor. It doesn't even necessarily need to be a check of information. No, 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 no. It's God saying, I've got you. And if you don't have peace, he's like, don't do it. Or it's not yet. It's not now. There's something else I need to do first. Are you guys with me? It's the witness of the Holy Spirit. It's the witness of peace. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And when you have the strength of God, when you have the love of God, when you have the word of God, you're going to have peace. That's just the description of incredibly strong peace. So these things all work together as you're walking in that relationship with him. Now we're going to get to the number one key text that I use to help me make big decisions when God isn't saying, do this, don't do that. Because very rarely does he do that outside of his word, which I already know or I know a lot of. I make most of my decisions based upon what God's word says. But when it's specifics, and what's the difference between a good idea and a God idea, right? It's a good thing, why wouldn't I do it, right? But it's a big decision, so I don't want to just jump into it. Here's the text. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will. Say will. And to act. Say act. In order to fulfill his good purposes. It is God who works in you to will. What does will mean? To desire. What does act mean? It means to do. God works in you to desire and to do his good purposes, number one, when you're fully his, number two, when you're walking with them in the spirit. I call it the growing knowing. I can't remember if I came up with that or if I heard it somewhere else. I'm getting old enough now that my memory's not as good, but I think that's so good I have to attribute it to somebody else. The growing knowing knowing. Have you ever had that? Where something felt right. And then it felt more right. And then it felt really, really right. The problem is, is when we're living in a posture where we're fully God's, we don't always just want to do what we want or what feels right for us. How do I know the difference between this is my flesh versus the spirit? Because there's a lot of things Russ wants in the flesh. Especially, I'm a car guy. If I could justify, I could justify cars and motorcycles and toys because it feels really good. When I'm trying to go on a diet and then right after Christmas, somebody still gives me some more sugar cookies, it feels right to me. Right? 
So if we're being honest, as mature Christians, how do we know the difference between the flesh and the spirit? I'm going to tell you very simply. This is what I tell people. This is what I tell myself. Pray the flesh out. God, as much as I want to do this, as much as this feels right, God, if this isn't you, I completely give it to you. I, I give it up. I will do the opposite, God. And you, when you know that you know that you are fine with giving up the right good thing, well, I'm not going to say the right, but the good thing that you think you should do, just in case it's not God's will, right? Seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you, right? First your will, God, then my will. And when you pray the flesh out, I believe what really remains is from God. As long as it doesn't con you know, contradict God's word. But when you pray that flesh out, at the core of your being and your spirit, usually what happens when you pray the flesh out, if it's God, the growing knowing grows. It goes from this to this. Anybody been through that? But the problem is, is our minds get in the way. Our minds get in the way. But God has given us the ability to, to discern between the two. And the, be, the best way, okay, and I've, I've saved, I cut my notes down so I could tell you this main story. The best example I can give you of how God led me when I was an absolute idiot was when I met my wife. So I was a missionary. I'm going to tell it really quick. It's a long story. I'm going to tell a shortened version. I was a missionary. I was a youth pastor, actually, in Singapore for almost five years, for four years. And I come back to America. I didn't want anybody to know that I was in town yet because I was in jet lag. I just wanted to be with my family, my closest friends. I knew too many people in town. My sleep cycle's messed up, so I couldn't go to any church because everybody knew me in these different churches. So I went to a non-denominational church with my mom. We were both visitors for the first time to a church my brother was attending. Nobody knows me. I sit down with my mom after worship, and the lady in front of us hands my mom a card, an envelope, a giving envelope, is your son single? Now, that never happened to me before. I don't look like my son back then. I had a different kind of metabolism. And my mom's eyes are big like mine because that's what I look like. My mom, and she just kind of looked at me. I looked at her. That's kind of weird. Then we had to wait after the whole message. And after the message, the lady turned around and goes, hi, I'm married. I'm not a stalker. I'm not weird. She goes, but I know a missionary girl that needs a missionary man. And I know Raleigh Hurst's brother is a missionary. And you look like Raleigh Hurst. I'm like, oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> All right. What do you think is going to happen? Yes, please, stranger, assign me a date with somebody. So I leave, but I ended up really liking the pastor. So I started going to two different churches at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. I just loved hearing good preaching. And I ended up actually becoming a part of this church. And I got to know her and her husband. He was the main news anchor in town on TV. And she was just this hyper extrovert like me and got along great. And she tried to set me up this girl. I was like, nah, not interested. The girl was weird. She wasn't interested, whatever. Praise God. But I made a friend. One day she goes, I'd like to have you over for dinner. Roast, mashed potatoes, sweet carrots. And I'm like, it's not Thanksgiving. What's up with this dinner? And I go, wait a minute. Are you trying to set me up? And she goes, what if I am? I said, I'll meet anybody over a home-cooked meal. And uh, <coughs> true story, I go. And lo and behold, who do you think's there? Carrie. So Carrie and I knew a lot of the same people. Great, you know, conversation. She's obviously beautiful out of my league. Of course, physically, I, I was attracted to her. But I'm like, I'm a missionary. I'm traveling to 26 different states in the next year. I'm 95% of the time on the road. I'm only in town two, three days. I don't have time to date. And there was a girl that I'd kind of been on again and off again with that I thought I might eventually marry. I wasn't dating her at the time. I really wasn't interested. And the lady made us exchange numbers. Did I pray about it? No. Because I thought I knew what God was doing in my life. I'm traveling around America. I come back to Springfield. I bump into her at a restaurant. I travel around America, come back to Springfield. My friend invites me to Thai food. His friend invited Carrie, not knowing that I was invited, purely by accident. And there we are again, and I never called her. She never called me, of course. Then I bump into her in Kansas City, and then I bump into her in Indianapolis. God, where are you? God, I'm almost 30. I've given everything. Where's my wife? He's like, you stupid idiot but I love you because you're my child. The mathematical odds, folks, we've told this story to agnostics and atheists when we were missionaries in Germany, and the mathematical German brain said that's impossible. And I still didn't see it. God, where are you? I don't have time to say other than to say all the giving dried up. I couldn't get my missions budget to save my life. Finally, a long story driving from Texas to D.C. 
out of the blue. I'm driving in a car with no radio, a depleted out Cadillac with no suspension, but it was comfortable. And I'm driving around America with no radio, just talking to God, and this is what I'm hearing. <sighs> Road noise. Now I'm not talking to God at all. I'm just zoned out for two states. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, it's over. I'm like, what? You and the girl. The other girl that I thought I'd eventually get together with. It's over. I'm like, cool. Because I kind of was having some insecurities about that relationship anyway. On my way to D.C., I'm at this couple's house in D.C. And this couple don't know them. They're an independent church. They're not somebody's of God. The only relationship I have with them is my dad. And I'm eating breakfast with absolute strangers that morning. And she goes, is there a special girl in your life? Now, I used to get that everywhere. Every woman at every church sees a single missionary. They think they know God's will for that missionary. So I used to always say the other girl, right, to get them off my back. But I knew that I'd be lying. So for the first time that year, I said, no, I don't. She goes, do you mind if we just pray for God to bring a godly woman to your life? And I'm like, what are you going to do? You're living in their house, eating their food, complete missionary mooch at the time. Sure. And we're standing there holding hands in triangular formation. I'm feeling like a loser. And this lady starts praying. And all of a sudden, you feel the Holy Spirit. And when she prayed, something went like this. After she prayed, I was like, lady, you can pray for me anytime. Man, I felt God. She goes, you know, I, hear, I believe God heard our prayer. I said, I believe God heard our prayer. She goes, you know, I felt like a click in my spirit. And I was like, I felt a click. You could feel something happen. That night, their babysitter doesn't show up. I said, well, hey, I don't know how to change diapers. If you change the diaper, I'll watch the kid while you guys go out to eat. So I'm watching their baby. And they go, oh, by the way, if you hear noises, that we're running out the basement to a couple um, they're Chi Alpha couple. Matter of fact, they went to that Bible school that you went to, and it ended up being this couple that I graduated with. So I hear noises. I knock. The guy comes up. I'm like, hey, Mike. Mike and Jen Godswell. Hey, how you doing? Haven't seen you in five years. Okay, da-da-da. He goes, hey, no offense. We got three different campus leaders downstairs and a guest speaker because uh, we had a big mission service, but we're watching the World Series. I said, hey, God bless you. We weren't close anyway. I said, hey, if I don't see you, I'll see you in heaven. Shut the door. Five minutes later, the door knocks. Open it. Who do you think's there? Carrie, we talked for four hours. I think she's the coolest girl. There are so many funny things that happened I don't have time to go into. I thought, what a great girl. And I really thought to myself, man, I wish I would have dated her a long time ago. I wasted all my time. Oh, well, I'm moving to Germany in a, in a month or two. So now I'm traveling, and, and, and I come back to Springfield, and she said, hey, if you ever you know, want to do something or whatever, and she was just talking to his friends. I said, no offense, I don't have any time. Long story short, I came into town for three days after being gone two months. And my final night, I'm like, man, I'm by myself again. I'm going on the road again by myself. I want sushi. None of my friends in Missouri eat sushi. Wait a minute. That girl in D.C. likes sushi. So I call her up. We go out to sushi. She thinks it's a date. I'm an idiot. I think it's friends. She feels something. She starts praying, God, if this is you, let it grow. Remember, we're talking about the growing knowing. I'm blur, as the Singaporeans would say. I'm clueless. I'm traveling around, I go to Chicago, then I'm calling my friends, hey bro, I can't, I'm stuck in winter, uh, my friends are like, bro, I'm at work, and I'm in this missions house waiting for my next service, and I'm like, hey, that girl from Kayaf, maybe she can call us, she's on four days vacation. Long story short, I, I said, well, what are you doing? She goes, not much. I said, well, hey, I said, I'm not doing anything either, and I said, I'm freezing up here, and she was on four days vacation. I said, man, I said, you're bored. I said, you ought to come up here, I'm bored out of my mind. She goes, are you serious? I'm like, well, that'd be kind of cool to have somebody to hang out with. I said, I know somebody you could stay with. So she flies up, and I'm like, wait a minute, this girl likes me. <laughs> Folks, I'm just showing you how stupid I was. She's already beautiful, shows up even more beautiful. She has homemade cookies, chocolate-covered pretzels, everything I never got as a kid. I'm in love. <laughs> no, seriously, I did fall in love with her that weekend. But now it's how many months of, oh, God, is this your will? And God never spoke to me. And it came down to the final day. Am I going to ask her to marry me or am I going to break up with her? And two pastors within 24 hours, I was driving on another ministry trip and I was getting to know her over the phone. I only got a chance to spend a little bit of time with her here and there because I was on the road. And I drive through North Ridgeville, Ohio, eating with a pastor. And he knew I was dating a girl. He goes, what are you going to do? I said, I think I'm going to break up with her. He's like, what? Why? I said, I haven't heard from God. He goes, Russ, don't be an idiot. He says, God isn't wanting you and I to be like a remote control car waiting for the next signal. He wants you to have his heart and his desires to make godly decisions. 
I'm like, okay, I'll think about that. Then another pastor friend, when I was saying goodbye, because I'm leaving for Germany in a week. He doesn't even know the other guy. He goes, what are you going to do? And Carrie was actually with me. We were spending the day together, and I'm just going, oh, I love this girl. Oh, I don't want to break up with her, but I haven't heard from God. He goes, Russ, what are you going to do? I asked her to leave the room. I said, I think I'm going to break up with her. He goes, what? He goes, don't be a fool. He goes, don't get super spiritual about this. The other guy said, don't get mystical. He said, don't get super spiritual. God wants you to have his heart, his mind, da, da, da. And so I hear the same thing from two godly guys I respect. Now I'm with Carrie that night, and I have to make a decision. And I was going to break up with her. But I didn't want to. And I thought to myself, what is it going to be like when you go to Germany without her? And it was like a lawnmower ran over my stomach. And it was just a sick feeling. I'd be depressed. Greatest girl I've ever met. And I thought, what if I asked her to marry me? Whew, joy and peace. How awesome would that be? And I mean, I felt like I was going to rip in two. The tension. I'm actually reliving the moment. And the Holy Spirit, for the first time, did this. I felt the slightest touch, like a feather landing on your skin. The slightest touch, the still small voice, the whisper. And this is what God told me. It's okay. I'm like, what? It's okay. In other words, make the decision. And I, a tenth of a second later, said, will you marry me? <laughs> And she's like, what? She didn't know this ADD, super spiritual guy was having this major conversation. And she's like, well, yes. And before she even said it, I felt this rush of peace and joy when I said it. And then she said, yes, I felt even more peace and joy. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have a ring. I don't have this. I don't have that. There's more to the story that I'm going to share next week when we talk about the 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 the, the what we call confirming guidance. But it's the growing knowing. So I want to I just get to the life application. So how do we have divine guidance? It's simple, but it's not easy. Number one, spend time with Jesus. We've got to learn to dwell with him. I am firmly convinced if you are 100% God's in consecration and you are doing your due diligence in your relationship with him, you can't miss his will. My story with Carrie proves it. I was a complete idiot. And God kept putting her in my path, kept giving me signs, kept doing all these things. But I was waiting for this voice, and God's word is his voice. If God's not speaking to you, his word will speak to you all day long. But you got to spend time with the Word, Jesus, in His Word, in His presence. You've got to walk with Him. John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. We're like sheep. Are we spending time with the shepherd? I think in 2022, I think believe God's called us to greater acts of commitment of time with him, greater acts of consecration, greater acts of intimacy and trust, but it's all in that relationship of dwelling with him. Spending time mentally, verbally, from the heart and spirit, in prayer, just talking to him, sharing life with him, thinking with him systematically start going through his word, reading God. Yes, verse of the day and new version is great, but go back to the context of it. Begin to read one of the gospels. Begin to go to the Psalms and the Proverbs. Begin to go through different books and begin to read them and slow and read and then study and then meditate. And what's going to happen is, is you're building up this bank account as you're spending time with the word in the word that later when you have these decisions, the Holy Spirit brings them out like a withdrawal. How many times have you had the Holy Spirit bring scriptures back to your remembrance that you don't even remember reading for the last couple years? But they're there, amen? So we need to be spending time with him in his presence, worshiping, prayer, intimacy, and he will fill you with his spirit. 
with his love, his assurance, his heart, his guidance. And as you're praying the flesh out, you'll get that growing knowing. And then secondly, it's simply this. Act on the inner witness. Don't disregard it. Don't push it away. Don't ignore it. Whether it's your conscience, whether it's the witness of the Spirit, especially, we want God to speak to us. But the last time he spoke to you, did you do what he told you to do? Did we act on it? That's how we desensitize ourselves. When we reject the witness of the Spirit, look at the story of Samson. The Spirit of God was so powerful in his life, and he slowly began to ignore what he knew was right and disregarded the Spirit. And then it said this phrase that's so sad. And he woke up, and the Spirit wasn't with him, and he didn't even know it. So you want to foster that. You want to as we said, spend time with Jesus. But when that conviction comes, when the witness of the Spirit comes, you act on it, listen to it. There's, there's times where I've looked back, I was doing this story, and I'm going, what? I remember this young Christian, I was in this small little Toyota truck, the two-wheel drive ones. You know, they look like a little tin can with the 14-inch tires. And I was, I, I didn't wear my seatbelt back then. And I was, I was getting ready, I was in the middle lane getting ready to turn into a parking lot to get my hair cut. And in the middle lane, I felt this, put on your seatbelt. I don't even know why I listened to it, because all I'm doing is crossing over and going into the parking lot. I put the click the belt on, two lanes are waving me through, and I didn't notice the turn lane and somebody going like they're going down Colonial, 50 miles an hour, hits me in the side, the truck spun around three times accident, coincidence that I put that seatbelt on, or the witness of the Spirit. I was a youth pastor in Singapore. I'm just thinking of different ones that came to mind. Youth pastor in Singapore, enjoying my evening. I had an evening off. Enjoy my evening. I worked tons of hours, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks. It was unbelievable. Great years, but and I had this witness of the Spirit to call one of my youth. Yeah, I had 450 youth, and it was just call Alina Ung. Call Alina Ung. And I'm like, what? Do I even have her number? Call Alina Ung. And I'm like, well, this is kind of weird because I'm the pastor and I'm a single guy calling a 15-year-old girl. Call Alina Ung. I call her. She's weeping. <gasps> Beth, I can't believe you're calling me. Ah! And she was getting ready. You don't understand how stressful the testing systems are in Singapore and Japan compared to here. If you do not get the best test, you will not be able to go to college. You will be streamed into lower levels of school, which will determine your occupation for life. The pressure is immense. And she goes, I was telling God, I was praying to God, I couldn't feel it. I said, God, if you're going to help me, if you could give me peace, have Pastor Russ call me. And you called. I was like, yes, the prophet is here. Let me pray a prayer of blessing over you, my child. It felt so good. We were doing a youth camp in Austria. And something said, go pray for the girl with the black hair, short hair. Marina was her name. I prayed for her. She starts weeping. Why? She said, God, if this is really, really you, have the guest speaker come pray for me. But I had to walk to the very back and go between aisles, 10 people, to lay my hand on her head. Go pray for the long-haired hippie guy. So I go pray for the long-haired hippie guy. He starts weeping. I just said, God, if you can give me a breakthrough in this sexual addiction, uh, sexual addiction and sin, have the missionary come pray for me. And they were both, I had to go, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and pray for them. It would be like me wedging my way in the middle of an aisle. When you begin to listen to the voice, God will confirm it. There's an excitement to it. And there's something about knowing that the divine hand is leading you. And it's in his word. It's in his spirit. It's in his presence. Can I hear an amen? God wants to lead you and guide you. Had so many other stories. I can tell you of other ones on 9-11 of a Korean church that I was preaching at. And it was right after 9-11. And there was like 12 different people in their congregation that worked at the Twin Towers. And all 12 of them had circumstances happen where they couldn't go. A check in their spirit that was something wrong. Don't go to work. They had no clue what was going on. Flat tire, whatever. And God protected 12 people. I think it was 12 people in that congregation. God will speak. God will communicate if we listen. Amen. How many want that to be your testimony? Let's just consecrate our hearts and lives right now. Would you just begin to talk to him right now? We've got some time. 
talk to him about whatever you're asking him to lead and guide. Say, Lord, show me in your word. God, give me that growing knowing. God, I pray, the, pray that flesh out right now before him. Holy Spirit, speak to me, lead me, communicate, download to me. Give me that witness, that check, that confirmation, and I will obey. And I believe he's going to speak, and I believe he's going to guide. But if you're here this morning, and you don't have a relationship with him, none of this works until your life is his. So while the rest of you are praying and talking, if you're here this morning, and you don't have a right relationship with God, you need to go all in with him. Would you give him your heart right now? Just say, Jesus. Say right now to him, Jesus, come into my life. I'm yours. You can have me. Forgive me of my sins. Wash away the past. Give me your Holy Spirit. I need your love. I need your presence in my life. Thank you for chasing me, Lord. Today I'm yours. And today you are mine. All it starts with is a willing open heart and he will come in. And you felt that conviction and he's going to turn it to peace and joy. You felt that love. He's going to give you that strength and that confidence. Speaking from the innermost part of who you are, from your spirit to him. And he will grow in you. Holy Spirit, fill that man or that woman, whoever they are this morning, God. Give them the sense of your beautiful presence. That life, that effervescent life, that hope, that faith that comes from living in you and under you. Under the shadow of your wing. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen.